Hello and good morning, everyone. We are so excited to partner with the Northeast Regional Center for Excellence in Vector-Borne Disease. Today, we bring to you the Integrated Tick Management Strategies and Barriers to the Prevention of Tick-Borne Disease webinar. I'm Maddie Gustafson, and I am a project coordinator at NEHA. And I would like to remind everyone that this webinar counts as one contact hour of continuing education credit with NEHA. Second, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to ask them in the question and answer. I would like to introduce you all to Dr. David Dijek, the Executive Director of NEHA, as he kicks off the webinar and introduces our first speaker. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, as you just heard, my name is David Dijak, Chief Executive Officer of the almost 7,000 member National Environmental Health Association. I'm pleased to kick off this webinar and to introduce our first speaker today. What I know and what I'm observing from a distance is that the quarantined and isolated population at large is salivating at the opportunity to embrace nature. And as that surge of humanity returns to the great outdoors, we would all be served by learning from those who can guide our decisions which aim to protect and promote the public's health. In my opinion, the nation's premier advocate for wise decision-making around ticks in general and Lyme disease in particular is the Live Lyme Foundation. And, I, and I'm not joking, they are a fabulous group and we are fortunate to have uh, and to hear directly from their executive director, Holiday Goudreau. And Holiday, I'm going to turn it over to you and thank you so much for being on the line with us today. Well, thank you so much for having us. It's a real honor to be here. Um, and I'll just start off by telling a little bit about the Lyme Foundation. My daughter, um, Olivia, started the foundation when she was 12. She's now 15. Um, and her goal was to raise money for children that could not afford their Lyme disease medication. Um, and she came up with this idea because she read um, a story about a single mom who was living in her car so that she could afford her son's medication. And that story just really stuck with her. So um, she started the foundation in January of 2017. And within the first hour of just launching our website, um, we had our first application for a family asking for funding for our child with Lyme. Since then, um, we have had over 500 applications from all 50 states. We've given 49 grants to children ranging in age from 2 to 21. Um, and we are seeing um, multiple families with, I mean, I would say 60% of the families have one or more child that has a tick-borne disease. So we've really come upon this sort of niche of, of helping these families who are very savvy. These families have been through the ringer trying to get their status. So it isn't like they're sitting there saying, hey, maybe my kid has a tick-borne disease. I mean, they have seen doctor after doctor and their kids are so sick. A lot are homeschooled, a lot are housebound. Um, so we're really trying to help this population. On top of that, Olivia also decided that, um, you know, she said, I'm trying not to be selfish here, but I also want to get well. And so the way to get well is we need to start funding scientific research. So we have funded um, three scientific researchers right now. One, uh, Dr. Rajadas at Stanford University, Dr. Ava ha Sapi at University of New Haven, and Dr. Ying Zhang at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And those three studies that we've worked with them on, um, I think are, are pushing the envelope of science of how to get better treatment, better testing, better drugs uh, for tick-borne diseases. We work with Dr. Rajadas on his acylocilin and um, his, um, uh, his other studies that he's working on, his disulfiram. And those two drugs, I think, do have potential. There obviously needs to be more testing. Um, with Dr. Ying Zhang, uh, we're working on essential oils study that he's working on that's very promising. And with Ava Sapi, we're helping her to where she can um, uh, test with the Borella on, uh, skin and not just in test tubes. So we're kind of in those three areas. And then we're looking uh, at funding a couple more scientists here in the next uh, year. So 
So that's kind of what Live Line started to do um, with Olivia. And I apologize that Olivia's not here today. Uh, she actually is in bed right now because um, she had two surgeries last week to get out a very large kidney stone and was in and out of the hospital and was incredible pain. Um, and as the doctors and her Lyme doctor, Dr. Richard Horowitz, and her good buddy, Dr. Neil Spector of Duke, um, both agree a teenager shouldn't have such a large kidney stone. They really feel it's because of all the treatment that she's been having for Lyme disease, whether it's the medication or the supplements that cause this kidney stone. So um, it's actually um, off being tested so that we can see what is going on. But it's just another example of how when you have a tick-borne disease, it just seems like it just never ends with the complications. So that's why she's not here today. Um, one of the things that Olivia, so we did that with children and with scientific research. And then uh, we were on vacation two years ago, um, and our dog Mo had 200 poppy seed ticks on his front left paw. And Olivia was like, is there an app to where we could see what ticks are around us? And truthfully, at that time, I really didn't care about her questions because I was trying to get the ticks off the dog. Um, but uh, she did her research. There wasn't. Uh, we met with some app developers, and eight months later, we've created Tick Tracker. Tick Tracker is a free global app in multiple languages that lets you track and report ticks in real time using geolocation. Um, we, uh, Olivia was selected by the United States Health and Human Services to compete in a 14 week tech sprint that's dealing with new tech tools um, that are helping uh, globally. And um, she competed and she won. Um, last March and she beat out Oracle and IBM and she spoke at the White House and the U.S. Census and the Department of Labor. Um, so we're working on that. We're getting lots of data in. It's very fascinating. We're working with the CDC. They like what we're, we're doing. Um, you know, this 2020 with this global pandemic has made everyone obviously, as David was saying, stay home, but then they're also going out more. And um, the national parks, Parks in general have seen an uptick of 300% of people going outside and um, using the parks, which is great, except um, they are forecasting that this is probably going to be the worst tick season in the record of keeping uh, records for ticks. So we're really trying to educate the public about, yes, please go out, please social distance, but please, 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 if you go out, please check for ticks. Check your dog for ticks, check your kids for ticks. Um, put your clothes in the dryer, take a hot shower, um, because, you know, there's a lot of similarities with COVID and a tick-borne disease. And so do you have COVID or do you have a tick-borne disease? We're doing a campaign right now showing the difference between if you have COVID and a tick-borne disease. And the really only difference is if you have a runny nose. So if you have a runny nose, you probably don't have a tick-borne disease. Um, so that's what we're working on. We also have a couple other things coming out. We're working on a Tick Tracker Pro. Uh, we met with a lot of scientists uh, regarding Tick Tracker who loved it but really wanted more kind of meat in the game so, um, so that they can really track and report ticks using more like humidity, geolocations, um, you know, ground co co cover, leaf cover. So uh, we're working on Tick Tracker Pro and uh, the National Park Service is using it this summer. We have Boy Scouts of America using it um, and we have some centers for excellence that are gonna be using it too. So that would be great. And then our last thing is that we're working on um, my I have twin boys who are 12, who are not sick, uh, who do not remember Olivia not being sick because they were three when she was bitten by a tick. And so they wanted to do something for the tick-borne disease community. So they are creating an online, online uh, gaming app called Tick Tick Boom. It's where you get to blow up ticks. Um, you have to take little cool adventures to get Promethean treated stuff, or tweezers, or all those stuff. So we kind of joke it's Fortnite for ticks. Um, we hope to have this out by the fall. And um, one of the things that will allow the user to do is if they turn on their geolocation, um, they can battle ticks that are in their area. So it's not like they're gonna be battling ticks that um, are not in their area. So our whole thing is um, to really try and educate this next generation coming up, kind of like our generation of where 
Now, we were raised that you always buckle your seatbelt. We really want to um, educate this next generation coming up that anytime you go outside, you need to tick check and tick check correctly. So that's what the Live Blind Foundation is doing. Um, we've had two summits that David was able to come, scientific summits, uh, with all of Olivia's scientists that she's working with. Uh, this year we probably will do another one, but it will be by Zoom. So um, we'll probably have that in September. Um, but I just really appreciate you guys having us here to talk about what Live Blind is doing. You know, please feel free to go to our website, liveblindfoundation.org, to learn more about what we're doing. And our whole goal of Live Blind is to never have another Olivia again. We do not want to have another child go through what Olivia went through. And we hope by our education, our awareness, dealing with scientists, helping children, that we can um, push the needle forward and really make a difference in the tick-borne world. So thank you so much for having us today. Thank you so much, Holiday. We really appreciate and so happy that you were able to join us today. And thank you for all that you do for the Vector community. Thank you. Sure. All right, so our next speaker is Dr. Kirby Stafford. He is the Chief Scientist uh, of the Department of Entomology and State Entomologist at the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station. He is a research, his research area is in ecology, distribution, and control of the black-legged tick, and more recently, the Lone Star, with a major focus in natural, biological, and integrated tick control. Dr. Stafford has co-authored and authored 92 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals, reviewed chapters in tick management in two books, and produced a tick management handbook and a fly management handbook, presented research at national and international meetings, serves on multiple regional and national tick-related communities, and given over 1,300 media interviews and public talks. Dr. Stafford oversees the Office of State Entomologist and works closely with the USDA APHIS PPQ, U.S. Forest Service and Deep Forestry on forest health-related issues. And prior to coming to Connecticut, Dr. Stafford worked at, worked at Penn State and obtained his Ph.D. At, in medical veterinary etymology from Texas A&M University, received his Master's of Science degree in etymology at Kansas State University, and a Bachelor of Science degree in etymology at Colorado State University. Dr. Stafford, please feel free to share your presentation. Okay, hello everyone. Got a lot of material to cover here this afternoon, which I hope you will find very uh, helpful. I'm gonna be talking about a variety of integrated uh, tick management strategies, as well as some of the barriers that we face in terms of trying to prevent tick-borne uh, disease. So, I like to start my talks with this quote from the textbook by Dan Sonnenschein on the biology of ticks. Few agricultural or health problems confronting human societies have proved as intractable as the control of ticks and the many diseases they transmit. Tick control has been and is heavily dependent upon chemical toxicants termed acaricides, but I'm gonna get into a lot of other approaches that have been taken uh, as well. But, <laughs> You know, if you look at the uh, past, uh, you know, from the early 1900s until now, we've just had a steady discovery of tick-borne pathogens that cause human disease uh, by a variety of different tick species. And it's accelerated here in more recent years. But the one, of course, most people are probably familiar with is the discovery of Lyme disease in Lyme, Connecticut area back in 1982, when the Borrelia burgdorferi was actually discovered, although Lyme disease itself was actually discovered discovered uh, in the mid-1970s. And as a consequence, not only do we have a lot of tick-borne pathogens, you can see that the number of tick-borne disease cases reported to the CDC has just continued to steadily increase. And this probably represents only about 10% of the actual diagnosed cases here in the United States. Of course, Lyme disease continues to be the major vector-borne disease here in the United States. But in 2017, you can see that other tick-borne diseases accounted for 27% of all the vector-borne diseases. So we're seeing an expanded uh, range of tick-borne diseases that people are, are dealing with. 
Now, there's about almost nearly 900 species of ticks worldwide, of which 84 occur in the United States. And there's only about 10 or so that are in major public or uh, health or veterinary importance. But we have records of about 40 of these species biting humans. Now, exotic ticks are also uh, of significant importance. We have a lot of non-native and invasive ticks that pose a threat to human and animal health. Ticks come in on people, even baggage, uh, you know, vacationing or traveling overseas on livestock, wildlife, animal products, and even through the commercial illegal pet trade. The one that's gotten a lot of news lately, and I'll briefly go over this here uh, in a moment, is the Asian longhorn tick, Haemophysalis longicornis. So this is a long list of ticks, but essentially there are three species that are responsible uh, for vectoring the majority of human diseases here in the U.S. That's the black-legged tick, Exodus scapularis, the lone star tick, Amblyoma americanum, and the American dog tick, Dermacenter variabilis. Other ticks of significance will include the Rocky Mountain uh, wood tick, Dermacenter andersoni, the western black-legged tick, Exodus pacificus, here, and the Gulf Coast tick, Amblyoma maculatum. These maps are only approximate uh, distributions for these ticks. And getting a better handle on the, where these ticks are found and what pathogens they're carrying is becoming of increasing importance. So the CDC has issued some guidelines for the surveillance of various tick species uh, in terms of what we call active tick surveillance. This is where researchers go out and actually sample or what we call drag for ticks and test them for tick-borne pathogens. Tick surveillance is intended to monitor changes in the distribution and abundance of ticks and the presence and prevalence of tick-borne pathogens in order to provide actionable, evidence-based information to clinicians, the public, and public health policymakers. Now, just a little background information here before we move on. Uh, most of these ticks that we're dealing with are three-host ticks. Uh, and so that means there's three different stages, the larva, the nymph, and the adult. Uh, each stage feeds on a different host animal. Uh, and then the female then feeds mainly on large to uh, medium to large mammal hosts. This is the life cycle for Exodus scapularis, the black-legged tick, where the engorged female after she falls off then lays about 2,000 eggs. Now, I just, before I move on, just a couple of comments on uh, a couple of tick species that we're seeing some increased activity from. The Lone Star tick is responsible for 90 to 95% of the tick bites in the southeastern United States. And it has its own suite of diseases. Uh, people are most familiar with, of course, our uh, black-legged tick, Exodus scapularis, which is the main vector for Lyme disease and a few other pathogens. But we're also seeing uh, this tick is responsible for lichiosis, a uh, variety of newly discovered viruses, uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, rickettsia. But the one that gets a lot of attention is the red meat allergy, uh, which uh, is associated with this tick as well. The interesting thing about this is this tick is expanding its range northward into the Midwest and Northeast. And I'm just citing a couple of my publications here where we discovered uh, a lot more of these ticks in Connecticut and moving up along the New England uh, coast. Uh, um, not established in Maine yet, but we did some overwintering studies where we found that uh, some of the ticks, adults, could survive even up in coastal Maine. So we're expecting to see an expansion of this tick. Uh, into New England, uh, as well as the Midwest. The other tick uh, getting a lot of attention, as I alluded to earlier, is the Asian longhorn tick, Haemophysalis longicornis. This East Asian tick was discovered on a sheep at a farm in Hunterton County, New Jersey, back in 2017. This East Asian tick is considered a serious pest to livestock, including uh, cattle, horses, sheep, and goats, but it will attack pets, particularly dogs, wildlife, particularly white-tailed deer, and occasionally humans. Although it does, the tick here in the U.S. doesn't really seem to prefer humans, although there are human tick bite records. But it is also known as a vector for a number of human and animal pathogens in its native range in parts of China, the Koreas, and Japan. At this point, this tick has been found or reported from 12 U.S. states, uh, mainly along the Appalachians from the, the Carolinas and Tennessee up to New York and Connecticut, as well as a detection out way out in Arkansas. 
this known distribution will continue to expand as surveillance efforts increase. Some recent research has found that it is not a vector for Brillia burgdorferi, the pathogen that causes Lyme disease, but it has been capable of transmitting rickettsia rickettsii, the pathogen that causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the laboratory. But at this point, it seems to be mainly a veterinary uh, concern, but it is definitely something to watch uh, going forward. So as we look at ticks as vectors, you gotta think about it. Ticks are found in wooded and successional habitats in relatively high numbers. The infection prevalence and tick-borne disease incidents are endemic and non-focal. Think about it, ticks don't fly. You must either enter or live in the tick habitat to become exposed. And one of the things we're dealing in many areas is a lot of homes are built right into forested, basically tick and host habitats, increasing the risk of exposure. So a lot of people want to know how, you know, what the percentage of infection in the ticks is. Well, infection prevalence is somewhat predictive of the transmission risk for tick-borne diseases, but really the number of ticks, tick abundance, and the number of tick bites that people actually receive really impacts your chance of encountering an infected tick. And your risk is really dependent on human behavior or whatever kind of personal protection measures you take and of course, tick checks. So there's two ways to look at this. Here's a quote from a paper where it just notes that there is increasing evidence from detailed analysis that rapid changes in the incidence of tick-borne diseases are driven as much if not more by human behavior that determines the exposure to infected ticks than by tick uh, population biology that determines the abundance of tick. Uh, but another viewpoint is that habitat diversity, environmental factors influencing survival and tick activity, and the geographic distribution of the ticks impacts your risk of tick-borne disease. And really it's both of those things that come into play as we're looking at people's risk of tick-borne disease. And another factor is climate and weather. You know, as we look at our warming climate, warmer annual temperatures will, can result in a generally northward expansion of the tick distribution, which I've already alluded to with the Lone Star Tick. Warmer temperatures can increase the reproductive capacity of ticks, leading to larger numbers. Higher moisture levels could allow tick survival in warmer environments. With milder winters and earlier springs, tick vectors will likely show earlier seasonal activity. We're starting to see some of that. And the mild and shorter winters also favoring the northern expansion of the white-footed mouse, for example, which is the major reservoir host for uh, the Lyme disease spirochetes and uh, as well as the tick here in the Northeast and Upper Midwest and larger tick populations, longer seasonal activity and expanding range of ticks will in likely increase the risk of human exposure to infected ticks as we go forward. So what is your risk of encountering a tick? Well, here in the Northeast, it's mainly residential. In the Western US, it's probably largely recreational. And this just shows you some uh, data from some passive surveillance. These are ticks that are submitted for testing. Um, and you can see in New Jersey and here in Connecticut that most of the exposure was outdoors at home for ticks that were being submitted uh, to the experiment station here in Connecticut for testing. 21% of people felt they picked up the ticks away from home. Uh, in New Jersey, home was 40%. Um, and then the high at risk activities was play. If you look at the Lyme disease national statistics, children are high at risk of tick bite and getting Lyme disease. And then also other activities like gardening and yard work or high risk activities uh, for exposure to ticks as well. So a lot of the research that's been done and approaches for managing ticks has focused in the residential environment. And particularly on the past couple of decades, focused on Exodi scapularis, the black legged tick and Lyme disease. These include education and behavior change, personal protection measures, landscape modifications, various approaches on chemical control, which can include either synthetic insecticides, a lot of interest in botanical compounds, natural compounds, biological control, host reduction and exclusion, host targeted acaricides, and even host targeted vaccines. But there's a lot of challenges to this. So when we're thinking about tick management broadly, uh, we're talking about different tick species, different tick ecologies, you know, different areas where the ticks are located, you know, forested habitat in the Northeast, for example. Who's responsible for tick control on private properties versus community or public lands? 
uh, including neighborhood green belts and school grounds and city, county, and state parks? How can we deal with the low acceptability of many current tick control methods that, uh, and limited willingness to, to pay for these control methods by many, uh, a lot of people? What methods are novel, ecological, or biorational in nature and for what specific ticks and localities and how sustainable are these approaches? A lot more research needs to be done. And then we're also dealing with variable and uncertain and unknown efficacy for a lot of these tick control methods. And we still don't know whether any of these methods can actually prevent disease. We may be able to control ticks, but can we actually impact the incidence of disease? Some other challenges include a lack of municipal or local vector control efforts specifically aimed at ticks. I mean, a lot of states may have, say, mosquito control districts, for example. There's little research on the control of other species of ticks of increasing concern. Uh, how can we get the industry to invest in developing new products for an unclear public health tick control market? How effective are broadcast acaricides when applied by homeowners versus pest management professionals? What's their efficacy in controlling ticks? And at least for Lyme disease, it's mainly a homeowner problem. And we largely, people largely rely on licensed commercial applicators to make these uh, tick control efforts. But of course, coming back, uh, the first line of protection is your personal protection measures. And I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this. Um, the important thing is there's a variety of repellents that you can use. Uh, personally, what I use is the permethrin-based clothing tick repellent. Uh, I treat my clothes before I go out to do tick work, um, and I have found it extremely effective. Over th almost 30 years here, I've had very few tick bites, and I haven't gotten Lyme disease yet. So um, it's a very, and you can also purchase permethrin. Uh, treated clothing uh, as well. And a recent study just came out over a two year period that reduced tick bites by 58%. And of course, bathing and tick checks and proper removing ticks are extremely important. Another approach has been looking at landscape or vegetative management. The thing to bear in mind is that most ticks require high humidity or cover for their survival. And most ticks are found in the leaf litter, the ground cover, and the lower ecotone vegetation. Remember, ticks don't fly, they don't jump, and they're not dropping from the trees. So most of the ticks are acquired on the lower extremities and can then crawl up and be found attached anywhere on the body. Here in the Northeast, in the forested habitats, I mean, I've collected ticks even in ground cover like Pacasanda right next to the front doorsteps. You know, so you don't have to necessarily go into the woods uh, to pick up uh, ticks. And a lot of times we get asked, well, what is the risk for children in schools? And you really think about school grounds in general. Most schools are largely landscaped in what I would call a more tick safe zone with lawns, mowed fields, uh, the playgrounds, of course, the school buildings themselves. It's really the real risk, I think, is the landscaping at the edge of the school grounds and particularly the past walking to school are where your areas of greater risk uh, are. So when you look at this slide here, I'm thinking in terms of what I would call tick safer trails. They're broad, they're semi-paved, um, where you have less exposure to the adjacent vegetation versus woodland trails. Quite often, these are the kind of trails kids that may be cutting through to get to school. Uh, and are you doing tick bite prevention? And of course, in this, age here where people are going outdoors to, uh, because of quarantine fatigue. Um, you know, how crowded are the trails? Um, you know, are, if you're actually spending increased time outdoors, is that really increasing the risk of exposure to ticks? So bear in mind, not only keep your social distancing when you're outdoors, but, uh, and have a mask, but uh, don't forget your tick bite protection measures uh, as well. Now these concepts also extend to residential landscape management. So removing leaf litter at the perimeter of a property I found could reduce the number of ticks right there in the immediate lawn by 49 to 70%. Uh, landscape barriers, uh, these are some studies I did years ago with uh, wood chips and so forth. Uh, we reduced the number of ticks moving from the woods into the lawn by 35 to 77%. And quite frequently when I visit homes, where do you find the swing sets? 
they're what I call back in the tick zone where you have a much higher risk of encountering ticks. You really need to move them out into more sunnier portions of the lawn. So what we found is that leaf litter actually increases the overwinter survival of Exodes scapularis nymphs and Amblyum americanum adults. That's the black-legged tick and lone star tick. And just to show you one year of the study, which has been published, you can see that where we uh, did not remove any of the leaves and did not remove any of the snow through the winter, we had a 94% survival rate in the nymphal ticks. And you can see where we remove the leaves and remove the snow that would provide insulation, we had 77% survival, and that was significantly less. And then there was a recent study that just came out where they found that leaf blown or raked accumulation of leaves was associated with an increased number of nymphal exodes scapularis ticks, as you can see in the graph right here, where your managed edge here had higher numbers of ticks. So removing those leaves offsite or bagging or composting them may help reduce your risk as well. Another factor on the vegetation is invasive plants. Higher tick counts are associated with exotic invasive forest understory than native understory. And we found that the abundance of adult black-legged ticks infected with Borrelia burgdorferi was great is in areas with dense Japanese barberry. And in addition, there was a greater number of lone star ticks infected with Ehrlichia uh, in stands of invasive honeysuckle. And the reason is because these dense stands of invasive vegetation provide an ideal microclimate for the ticks as well as many of their hosts. And so studies have found that reducing and long-term management of barberry or reducing or removal of honeysuckle can reduce the abundance of infected ticks. Spraying, the application of a caricide, continues to be one of the major methods of control. These can include synthetic uh, caricides or insecticides such as your carbamates, your pyrethroids, or neonicotinoids. Those are used only on uh, animal products. Um, I did a lot of work uh, developing the microbial biopesticide Metarizium anisophily, MET52. This is a fungus. Uh, uh, entomopathogenic fungus. Uh, it's a suspension of the spores. It, uh, these fungi occur at very low levels naturally in the soil, so it's a biocontrol approach. And you can see the female black-legged tick there that's been killed by this fungus in the center of the slide. And of course, there's been a lot of interest in botanicals and natural occurring substances, including plant extracts, which are mainly, mainly essential oils. And a lot of these uh, are actually are listed on the EPA's 25B list of minimum risk pesticides. The disadvantage of these, a lot of these essential oils is that since they don't have to prove efficacy, a lot of these products will get marketed um, and they do not have to register with the EPA. They do not have to prove efficacy before they come on the market. So it's kind of hard for researchers such as myself and my colleagues to kind of keep up with evaluating how effective the various ones are. Many of them do not work, but there are some that do. And this is a quick slide summarizing uh, many years of research. The pyrethroid insecticides generally are quite effective in controlling um, nymphal exodes scapularis, as you can see here, in many cases almost up to 100% control for several weeks. Seven, a common garden insecticide, also provides high levels of control. The metarizium, that uh, biocontrol fungal agent, MET-52 also can potentially provide high levels of, uh, of control. There was one product that can, uh, rosemary oil-based product called IC2. Uh, this was published, provided high levels of control, but some other essential oil products have been much less effective. But then there was a big study, a uh, tri-state study that was conducted uh, in Connecticut, Maryland, and New York using a pyrethroid called bifenthrin. Uh, they got 75 and surprisingly low 48% reduction in ticks compared to the placebo, that is water treated properties. And there was no difference in the number of ticks encountered by participants and risk of disease. So it had no impact on your actual disease risk, but it's effective in killing ticks. And I think that really brings in the question on how these materials are applied and how residents use their yards and there are other sources of tick exposure. Another question from an environmental standpoint, 
is what impact do these control methods have on pollinators? Bees, including honeybees and bumblebees and solitary bees are our prominent and economically most important group of pollinators worldwide and 35% of the world food depends on pollinators. Carbaryl, R7, is used for the control of ticks or can be. Um, it's a common garden insecticide, but it is extremely toxic to bees and beneficial insects, moderately toxic to fish, but relatively non-toxic to birds. Most of the current chemical used for area-wide tick control are those pyrethroid insecticides I alluded to earlier. They're derivatives of the natural pyrethrins, chemically modified to increase their toxicity and stability. These include things like permethrin and deltamethrin and so on, but they're highly toxic to bees that are exposed directly during application or residues on blooming crops. Something else to bear in mind. The neonicotinoids are a class of insecticides that are water soluble and systemic in plants and used in a lot of agricultural and lawns uh, pest control. Uh, two of the compounds, imnocloprid and denofuran, are used in products for flea and tick control on domestic animals, but they're not used for area-wide control of ticks, but they're very, most are very toxic to honeybees as well, and states have been restricting their use. Europe has actually banned a lot of their use. And even some of the botanical insecticides uh, have been found to have toxic or sublethal effects. So I'm quoting from this one publication, the potential acute toxicity and sublethal effects of botanical insecticides on honeybees and thereby, uh, and also provide evidence of the importance of assessing the risk of side effects of biopesticides uh, is a concern. Uh, they're often touted as environmentally friendly to non-target organisms such as pollinators. Bear in mind, if they kill ticks, they're likely to kill some other things as well. A couple of things to watch going forward is a nucatone. This is a component of the essential oil from Alaska yellow cedar, but you can also get it from grapefruit. And a number of us did a lot of research with this compound on our CDC grants. It's very effective in controlling ticks. It's a very good repellent. And there's a company now that is developing a product uh, with Nucatone called Nuka Shield. Uh, it's currently under uh, review for registration at the EPA. Uh, and if, if people are in, interested in keeping track or following up on this, the link uh, from Ebola uh, is down below there. Um, another concern is this biocontrol MET52 product. Um, there's a lot of rumors going around that the company is seeking to sell or maybe discontinue that product, which would be a loss because it's one of the few what I call biorational or biocontrol method products that we have available for tick control. Another approach uh, that has been looked at uh, is host targeted tick control. Um, so the first approach is targeting our rodent reservoir hosts such as white-footed mice and eastern chipmunks for the control of Ixodes scapularis. The first product that came available in the late 1980s were the tick tubes. These are permethrin-treated cotton balls, which uh, the mice collect the cotton and take it back to their nests uh, to kill the ticks that are present there. More recently was the development and commercialization of the fipronil bait boxes. This is a box that contains uh, two non-toxic food blocks with a wick containing fipronil. Now, fipronil is the active ingredient in front line for flea and tick control on dogs and cats. It's quite effective in controlling ticks on mice. So the idea is that you would be killing ticks on the mice instead of the mice picking up ticks and infecting them. So these are two approaches that uh, have been uh, commercially marketed for post-targeted tick control. But I will point out this, these products would not be effective for Lone Star ticks as the immature stages of that tick don't readily use rodent hosts. The other host targeted tick control uh, approach has been targeting white-tailed deer, either by excluding deer, reducing deer populations, or treating deer. So studies have found that fencing deer out of an area of even acres can significantly reduce tick populations. Uh, reducing deer numbers uh, can also reduce tick populations, but you do have to get deer down to a fairly low population density of around 10 to 13 deer per square mile. And of course, treatment is done by this device developed by the USDA uh, Agricultural Research Service called a four poster. It consists of a, a, a bin holding whole kernel corn. When the deer come up to feed, they brush up against these paint rollers which are treated with permethrin. 
killing the ticks that are on the deer. And um, I do have a deer targeted method uh, review paper that's available from the Journal of Integrated Pest Management. This is open access if anyone wants to follow up on this approach and the research that's been done uh, uh, on this. And I should point out that deer reduction and treatment of deer uh, are the only approaches so far that have shown any data impacting actual disease risk. So when we look at our tick-borne disease um, toolbox today, uh, we have a lot of approaches. So you have your variety of, of personal protection measures, protective clothing, variety of different kinds of repellents. Uh, we don't have a human vaccine at this point, um, but I've already briefly highlighted landscape and vegetative management, um, killing host-seeking ticks with a synthetic acaricides, fungal acaricides, or natural-based products, rodent-targeted approaches, as well as deer-targeted approaches, which include, as I mentioned before, um, topical acaricide feeding stations, those, those four posters, deer reduction, and deer fencing. But some other research is being done on looking at other methods of treating the deer, uh, even possibly an anti-tick vaccine for deer, which I think would be really great. Um, and so a lot of research is continuing on some of these other approaches. So finally, one of the last kind of uh, approaches, since no one single approach seems to be a silver bullet, is looking at integrated tick management. That is combining different techniques, targeting the various different hosts, as well as the tick itself. And I don't have time to go into a whole lot of details uh, on these approaches and the research that's being done on this, but I want to point out in the Journal of Integrated Pest Management, there are two review articles uh, that people can readily access. Uh, one I did on integrated pest management and controlling ticks and tick-borne diseases, and some colleagues did a review on an application of these technology for both black-legged ticks, lone star ticks, and American dog ticks as well, and I encourage you to look these up. And again, they are open access at the Journal of Integrated Pest Management. But of course, none of these techniques are gonna work if people don't do it. So this was a uh, national health style survey that uh, was published in 2015. And it looked at tick exposure and percent seeking health care as well as uh, use of various tick prevention measures nationally. And as you can see, you're looking at, you know, uh, New England, the Mid-Atlantic, and uh, North Central states, you're looking at 22 to 20, 30 percent of people reporting a tick exposure by a household member. Uh, somewhat less in the mountain and Pacific states, around 4 percent. Um, but nonetheless, nationally, you're looking at a fairly high rate of tick exposure, according to the survey. But ironically, I don't have time to go over all of the various different regions, but I just want to point out the top line, the overall results of this study in terms of uh, prevention measure use, only 21% reported using a repellent, only 15% reported showering to check and doing, uh, to, which would be part of your tick checking, doing tick checks 30%, other steps only 7.6%, but look, 51% do nothing. And only 10% would use yard pesticides, and 10% said they would absolutely not use any yard pesticides to control ticks. So I think we need to do a lot better message, uh, messaging to get um, higher use of various prevention measures to re reduce people's exposure and risk of uh, tick-borne disease. So where do we go from here? Widespread and difficult to control diseases from tick bites are major causes of sickness and even death in some cases worldwide. Uh, there's a growing number and spread of tick-borne diseases poses an ongoing and increasing risk in the U.S. As I kind of briefly highlighted, we have a lot of tools for killing ticks, but the impact on disease is often unclear, unproven, and few of these methods are available or utilized by homeowners. We need more safe, cost-effective, and socially acceptable prevention tools, but we still have, as I mentioned, a lot of multiple challenges or barriers to effective tick management. 
Dr. Lars Eisen and I just recently published this forum uh, paper. It is in the public domain, open access at the Journal of Medical Entomology on the Barriers to Effective Tick Management and Tick Bite Prevention in the United States. And we highlight that uh, as well, a number of these barriers, and some of these barriers have also been highlighted by the uh, uh, Health and Human Services Tick-Borne Disease Working Group and their various subcommittee committee reports. And these include skepticism and public distrust of chemical pesticides and repellents, uh, lack of social acceptability for deer management, uh, a low willingness to pay for effective tick control measures, a lack of funding for large-scale neighborhood and community area-wide studies, increased pesticide-resistant concerns and the pollinator health concerns, which I just briefly uh, touched on, declining public health entomology workforce and lack of funding to support employment to sustain continued tick-borne disease prevention research. And so basically the real issue comes down to the effectiveness, scale, cost, and implementation, uh, which are the key components for tick management strategies. So basically, you know, what we really need is a more broader One Health approach. You know, these tick-borne diseases are difficult to control due to their complex epidemiology and ecologies. And so it really, we need to involve the, what I call the animal branch, veterinarians, wildlife biologists, veterinary entomologists, and the human branch, physicians, medical entomologists, and vector biologists, and epidemiologists, and so forth. Basically all to come together, looking at a more environmental health approach. And a big part of this now, there's five universities with various partners were established as regional centers of excellence for vector-borne disease to help prevent and rapidly respond to emerging vector-borne diseases across the United States. And each of these sites has their own website with a lot of resources as well. And of course, this presentation is co-brought to you by the Northeast Regional Center of Excellence, which is uh, housed at Cornell University. So I'll wrap this talk up uh, with an old prayer from 1856 from red bugs and bed bugs, from sand flies and land flies, from mosquitoes, gallinippers, and fleas, from hog ticks and dog ticks, from hen lice and men lice. We pray thee, good Lord, give us ease. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Stafford. I, we really appreciate it. And um, before we move on to the question and answer portion of this webinar, I would just like to make folks aware that um, following this webinar, you'll be directed to a brief survey. So if you could please fill this out, um, this would benefit our team to identify um, anything that we need to improve or webinars that you may be interested in the future. Um, so with that being said, we'll start off with our first question. Um, so, uh, and any of the speakers today can feel free to, to respond. Um, what is the role of dogs in transmission of tick-borne diseases? Okay, well, I mean, dogs obviously can pick up ticks and bring them into the home. Um, there are a lot of products available for controlling dick, uh, ticks on your dog. Uh, as well as several canine vaccines for Lyme disease available to your dog as well. So, you know, talk to your veterinarian. There are several ways to manage that risk and exposure, um, you know, from your dog, as well as protecting your dog uh, from various tick-borne diseases as well. I would also add to that that um, the vets that we've talked to, that if your dog has a tick, you need to be checking your child and yourself. The likeliness if your dog has one and you're walking, you probably have one too. So if you see a tick, check it. And yes, there's all sorts of, um, I feel like the dogs actually have better protection than the humans. So yes, you can go to your vet and get lots of tick medication, Lyme vaccines, et cetera. Yeah, actually dogs will start picking up ticks uh, even before humans in some of the very early research that was done uh, monitoring the expansion of Lyme disease was done by canine sero surveys because they would become infected with the Lyme pathogen even before it started showing up in humans. Okay, great, thank you. So the next question is, when should preventative antibiotics be considered after a tick bite to prevent tick-borne disease? What are uh 
Well, first of all, you know, I am not a doctor, so you need to consult with your medical professional. But my thing, I'm of the, the belief as soon as you can get antibiotics and just take them prophylactically and go get it, please save your tick and get it checked tested to see if it carries any pathogens and then you can go from there. But again, I'm not a medical doctor. Okay, jumping back to the um, dog question about the transmission of tick-borne diseases, do you, is there also um, similar responses to cats and other household pets? I didn't quite catch that one, Maddie. Oh, sorry. Um, so the, this is just a follow-up question on the dog, um, the role of dogs in transmission of tick-borne diseases. Is this also the same for cats and other household pets? Um, cats are much less susceptible uh, clinically um, to some of these uh, various uh, tick-borne pathogens, particularly Lyme disease. Um, even on dogs, bear in mind that probably only around 5% of the animals uh, will actually become clinically ill. I mean, any dog that goes outdoors is going to pick up ticks and get infected. I mean, that's just, that, that's just the reality. Um, and again, you want to provide protection for your animal, uh, both for the an uh, dog and for yourself. Um, but that's why maybe even the, using the vaccine, for, uh, Lyme vaccine for the dogs is important. Because if your dog gets ill, it can get seriously ill, and there is a uh, somewhat more rare um, kidney failure that can happen with Lyme disease in dogs. And if that does happen, your vet can't save your dog. So, you know, consult your veterinarian, use some proper protections, and possibly the vet, a canine vaccine for your dogs. Great. Okay, the next question is. Is there any specific time frame to, for removing a tick to reduce the risk of disease transmission? Does immediate removal reduce risk? The, um, yes, the immediate removal. <laughs> it, those tick checks are extremely important. Um, and yeah, I mean, sometimes there's a little bit of controversy about that, but there's a number of studies that have clearly shown that it takes 24 to 36 hours for the Lyme spirochete to be transmitted from the tick to a person. Um, and that's because the spirochetes are in the tick gut. When the tick begins to feed, they multiply. They actually have to migrate through the body of the tick to the salivary glands to get injected in. And that's why the tick checks are extremely important. And basically that 24 hour window holds for most of the other tick borne pathogens as well. The one exception is the rare Powassan virus, which can be transmitted within 15 minutes. So the bottom line is, if you see a tick, get it off immediately. Exactly. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question is, has there been any documentation of, oh, any documentation of increased in tick encounters recently due to the increased outdoor activity because of quarantine fatigue? Not yet. Although there, are, is some, uh, there is some research being done uh, on looking that question. Uh, there are some surveys that have been conducted, um, wide, widespread surveys looking at that very question. It'll be interesting to see what the results show. And I would concur with Dr. Sanford that um, the, the park services are showing an uptick, no pun intended, of 300% of people um, going to parks and outdoors. So it, it just, it, it's when the, re, when the survey that uh, Kirby's talking about comes out, it's going to be that yes, people are going to have been more exposed to the outdoors and to tech. So I would assume it's going to go up. I like the uh, pun. <laughs> um, so the next question is, where can we send ticks to get tested? There are a number of commercial laboratories that will take ticks nationwide for uh, testing. Um, here in Connecticut, we do provide free testing, but only for Connecticut residents. And I would say, so on Tick Tracker, we have a list of places that you can go get your um, tick tested. Some obviously are private companies that cost money. You know, a lot of health departments will test 
your ticks. So I would reach out to your health department, see if they will. If not, you can go to ticktracker.com and we have a list of places where you can send your tick off to get tested. And it's fascinating to get them tested. We've had some tested and some ticks come back with nothing. And then obviously, you know, my daughter got bit and it, she had lots of pathogens. So it, it's very interesting, but I highly recommend that if you pull off a tick, you keep that tick and you send it off and get it tested. Great. Um, the next question is, how close are we to developing a viable Lyme disease vaccine for humans? That's an open question. There is a company that does have a new version of this uh, original OSPE vaccine. It's um, undergone uh, phase one trials. It's currently in phase two trials. Some initial uh, reports on those phase two trials were supposed to come out sometime here in 2020. Uh, and the question is whether they'll have the resources to proceed on to phase three trial. So it is possible we may have a, a Lyme vaccine uh, for humans again, but um, it's an open question when that will happen. Yeah, I would concur that, you know, it's, it's a very polarizing question about the vaccine, um, just because, so if there is a vaccine, obviously it needs to be safe and effective. Um, and Valneva is the one, is the company that's working on it, and we'll see where they take it and what happens in the next couple of years. And vaccines take a while to roll out, so it's not like we're going to have this next week. Um, but we also have to remember, so great, you get vaccinated for Lyme disease, ticks can carry up to 40 other diseases too. So you still, no matter what, you're still going to have to protect yourself, tick check, anytime you go out. So in a bizarre way, if you get the Lyme vaccine, you don't want, you know, the public to have this uh, false sense of security when they can go and get bitten by a tick and get all sorts of other diseases. All right, the next question, um, I think we have time for a few more. Um, what are the most effective methods to remove a tick? Seems to be there are a lot of different methods out there. Well, I personally prefer fine tip forceps, uh, particularly when you're dealing with the smaller stages of the tick. And I mean, they are very small. Uh, it allows you to get a really good grasp of the mouth parts close to the skin and then gently and firmly pull them out. Um, there's a number of tick removal devices uh, on the market. Uh, some work better than others and some don't work at all. And a lot of them are really, some of them are really designed for something like a fully engorged American dog tick or Rocky Mountain wood tick, a much larger tick specimen attached, uh, as opposed to very small immature stages like a nymphal black-legged tick. Um, and those wouldn't be too effective for those. So again, my own personal preference is really fine tip forceps. And I would, I would add to that, um, the biggest thing you want to do that we're trying to re-educate the public, it's not like when we were growing up, you take a match and you try to get it out. That is like the worst thing you could possibly do. What you want to do is try and get, like um, Dr. Schiffer said, you know, something to wiggle the tick loose so it, it, it's, it unlatches off because the worst thing you want is the head stuck in your, in your body. So um, we uh, at ticktracker.com and at livelinefoundation.org um, show you exactly how to get rid of a tick. And we have printable PDFs that you can use um, to just show the correct way to remove a tick. But the biggest thing is you want to make sure that you get the head out of your skin. Well, you know, the other thing to bear in mind, I mean, the, the tick removal and so forth is also covered in my tick management handbook. Um, if the mouth parts get broken off, bear in mind that it won't have any bearing on whether you get Lyme disease or not. Uh, you either have removed the tick in time or you have not. Um, but if the mouth parts get broken off, um, think of it analogous to like a splinter that you can't get out. It's foreign tissue in the skin. There's a chance, obviously, any break in the skin of secondary infection. Um, but you don't need to make a trip to the hospital to get out those mouth parts. Um, so basically, probably apply a, a um, you know, topical antibiotic um, and, um, and just go from there. 
Great, thank you so much. And we are right at uh, 11 o'clock mountain time here. So we um, have neared the end of the webinar and just wanna thank all the attendees that have joined us today, the questions that you asked and the speakers that presented and thank you. Please fill out the survey um, as you are directed that way and have a great rest of your day.